And we are live. Hello, it's so great to be with all of you again. This time it's the sixth Chase U post-human studies workshop. And as always, we try to bring together sort of the local scholars, scholars from Rome, um, scholars and intellectuals from the Chase U community, and most importantly, also students from John Cabot University in Rome, and to get all of them connected with some of the world's leading scholars in the field of post-human studies. And this year is a particularly important year in that field, as we've got a couple of anniversaries in this year. So 2021 is the year of the 700th anniversary of Dante's death, as well as the 70th anniversary of the concept of transhumanism as it was coined by Julian Huxley in an article published in 1951. At the first glance, it seems that these two anniversaries do not have anything in common. However, there's one issue which needs to be noted. Dante counts as one of the fathers of Italian language, and he has coined a lot of words. The word bel paese, like the beautiful country, was created by him which is still being used to refer to Italy, as well as the word fertile, which comes from the Latin fere, and which means to carry. It carries an abundance of fruits. In addition, he also wrote the following lines in his text on the paradise. Ant sumanar significar per verba non si poria però l'esempio basti a cui esperienza grazia serva. Dante coined the word transhumanar, which means to move beyond the limitations of the human. However, this doesn't turn Dante into a transhumanist, of course. The content in which he used the word made it clear that he didn't have this worldly evolution in mind. However, Dante was at least responsible for coining the word, which is already something. It took quite a few centuries until sort of the modern version and concept of transhumanism was coined. It was in 1951 when the concept of transhumanism was first coined by Julian Huxley. He published in, in his article, Knowledge, Morality, and Destiny in this year. Most people think it's only in 1957 um, in his book when he coined the term, but it was already, he already published an article in 1951. So this year it's the 17th anniversary of the word transhumanism. There he described transhumanism as follows, I quote, such a broad philosophy might perhaps best be called not humanism because that has certain unsatisfactorily connotations, but transhumanism. It's the idea that humanity attempting to overcome its limitations and to arrive at fuller fruition, it's the realization that both individual and social developments are processes of self-transformation, unquote. I regard this formulation still as the best possible definition of transhumanism. The concluding chapter of Julian Huxley's book, New Bottles for New Wine, published in 1957, is entitled Evolutionary Humanism. And the relationship between evolutionary humanism and contemporary transhumanism must still be clarified more precisely. There seems to be a structural analogy between transhumanism and evolutionary humanism, which needs to be considered when clarifying the relationship between humanism and transhumanism, and also between traditional humanism and evolutionary humanism. Julian Huxley also had a brother, who at least is as well known as he himself, Aldous Huxley. Probably more people think of his brother than, than of Julian Huxley when the name Huxley comes up. And between Julian Huxley's affirmative considerations concerning the impact of technologies and those of his brother, Aldous Huxley, the author of the critical novel, Brave New World, there are significant tensions in terms of content. Julian Huxley also shares his fundamental evolutionary approach with his grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley, who distinguished himself as Darwin's supporter. He was known as Darwin's bulldog. Julian Huxley's half-brother, Andrew Feeling actually was also active as a natural scientist. He was a university professor of biology in London and even won the Nobel Prize, but is currently probably less well known than the other family members already mentioned. Julian Huxley was a university professor in London too. In addition, he was the first general director of the UNESCO who made a significant contribution to the first declaration of human rights. 
that was politically extremely influential. However, but he was also on the board of the British Eugenics Society. The close friend of Julian Huxley was a Catholic evolutionary thinker, Théa de Chardin, who used the words transhumanizing in the future of man. That's the title of his book. The reflections of this Jesuit priest are still of great relevance for considering potential religious aspects of transhumanism and for further clarifications concerning the relationship between Christianity and transhumanism. The consideration of evolutionary thinking has brought about a paradigm shift in many academic disciplines. The various members of the Huxley family have been highly influential in making a wider public aware, um, in making wider public aware of the relevance of evolutionary thinking, which was the reason why we decided to dedicate this event to the members of the Huxley family. At the same time, it must also be acknowledged that certain practices of social Darwinism and a state-governed eugenics have led to some of the worst atrocities of the 20th century. And as I noted earlier, Julian Huxley was a board member of the British Eugenics Society. I regard it as utterly important to always consider the lessons we've learned from these historical atrocities. Political and paternalistic and totalitarian systems undermine the plurality of human flourishing. The specific implications of this insight permanently need to be interpreted with every new scientific development. And this is a central endeavor of the post-human studies workshop series, which has now been going on already for, for four or five years. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the various presentations in today's workshop. And I pass on the words to Prunella. Thank you, Steph. Yes, exactly. Uh, your uh, reference to Dante makes me think of transhumanza, which actually means uh, the way the shepherds would move uh, their cattle and sheep out of their territory. So this going beyond the territory, which which is the humus, humus means that earth, and it also is the uh, source for the term human. So maybe the human should be brought not back but brought forward into a wider territory that is uh, bigger than the human that is not anthropocentric so it's a very nice association with evolution uh, whatever uh, may mean that transhumanism is connected to evolutionary and whatever is connected to evolutionary implies a eugenics not in the sense of the nazi but in the sense not in the sense of Sele artificial selection, but in the sense of improving and avoiding suffering and repairing what is uh, what seemed to be uh, not repairable before. So this going uh, ahead, this going beyond is what transhumanism in all of its uh, different stances and positions uh, may mean. So uh, welcome all of you to this uh, uh, open seminar, open workshop in which these many stances and positions can uh, meet and can be confronted with one another, making a real workshop in which uh, we do not have any uh, uh, a priori agreement about anything. This is what makes our workshop uh, real and uh, effective and uh, important. Uh, so all of us are very curious to listen to John Bongrad about this uh, next uh, evolutionary step, which seems to, to be so incredible. <laughs> thank you all and thank you, Josh. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Antimarini and Professor Sogner. And welcome to all our speakers and presenters today. And also to all the participants tuning in from all around the world for our event um, titled Animaloids and Plantoids. The 70th anniversary of transhumanism is in 2021 this year, and this event is dedicated to the Huxley family. And the event is split up into two parts. This evening, um, March 6, we will be talking about transhuman living beings. And then a second part of this event will be um, in November, November 6th, and the presenters will be exploring transhuman living beings in art. And with that, we are really absolutely thrilled to welcome Professor Josh Bongard as our keynote speaker today, and he will be kicking the evening off. And if I could introduce him, Josh Bongard is the Vaynot Professor of Computer Science at the University of Vermont and Director of the Morphology, Evolution and Cognition Laboratory. 
His work involves automated design and manufacture of soft, evolved, and crowdsourced robots, as well as computer-designed organisms. His work was acknowledged by a research award presented by former U.S. President Barack Obama at a 2011 White House ceremony. He is the co-author of the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, the instructor of an evolutionary robotics MOOC and director of the robotics outreach program, Twitch Plays Robotics. And today his presentation is entitled The Xenobot, the first computer designed organism. So with that, I will be removing everyone else from the screen and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christy, Chrissy, and thanks, uh, Stefan and the other organizers of the workshop for inviting me. I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to this evening. Um, I'm delighted to hear that uh, the theme this year is evolution and specifically the mention uh, of the Huxley family. Um, and that's actually where I'd like to start uh, my discussion today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Xenobot, um, arguably the first computer designed uh, organism. And in order to put the Xenobot into context, I wanted to start by talking about all the ways that we know of as humans to influence uh, evolutionary processes in living systems. Before I talk about that, I, I also want to call out an additional anniversary. Um, 2021 is the 100th anniversary of the word uh, robot. Uh, many people consider the Xenobot uh, a living robot. It was coined by uh, Carl Capek in his play, Rossum's Universal Robots. Okay, so uh, again, going back to thinking about evolution, um, I'd like to start with uh, artificial selection, which is uh, also where Darwin started his book, The Origin uh, of Species. Um, humans, our, our human ancestors have known for tens of thousands of years, one surefire way to bend living systems to our will, which is to control who reproduces uh, with whom. Uh, over the last uh, several thousand years, we've domesticated teosinte into corn, wolves uh, into dogs, and so on. The disadvantage of this approach, of course, is that it's exceedingly slow. So in more recent times, we have discovered a second way to influence living systems, which is genetic uh, engineering. Um, it is much, much faster than artificial selection, but comes with a cost, which most of us are aware, with, are aware of. The first one, of course, is that if we wish an organism to have a particular trait, where in the genome do we perturb things? Where do we make a change? to result in that desired phenotype or that desired uh, behavior or anatomy. The cost, of course, is that by improving one particular trait through genetic modification, we may unknowingly introduce other traits into the genetically modified organism that are not so desirable. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the EU is leading the charge in regulating uh, genetically modified uh, organisms. What I wanna talk about today is a very recent third way uh, my team and I have discovered uh, to influence biological systems. Um, so I'm here representing uh, three other members uh, of our research team, Michael Levin uh, at Tufts University and his colleague, Doug Blackiston, also at Tufts. Mike and Doug are biologists. And the fourth member of our team is Sam Kriegman, uh, my computer science uh, postdoctoral associate. Okay, so um, the xenobots were produced, and I'll show you some xenobots in a moment, using a third way of manipulating genetic material, which is instead of uh, selective breeding or genetic modification, is to influence the environment in which the organism grows. The name xenobot is derived from Xenopus uh, lavis, a particular type of frog, and the xenobots as you're gonna, are you, that you're going to see are genetically unmodified uh, frogs, but they don't look anything like a wild type uh, frog. It turns out um, that plants are relatively receptive to this uh, environmental influence. And if I could share my screen for a moment, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Um, this is a uh, genetic, uh, this is an espaliered uh, apple tree. Um, as you can see, obviously the environment in which this tree grows has been uh, modified and plants are very receptive to espalier or environmental influence on the way that they grow. Um, organisms or animals, on the other hand, seem to be a very different, uh, different situation. We seem to grow towards a particular adult form and, and it's very difficult to deflect us away from that form. 
But recent work uh, by my two colleagues have, and others have demonstrated that this is not quite uh, the case. Um, this is not a post-human, I guess this is a post-frog. Uh, what you're looking at is a tadpole that has an explanted or surgically implanted eye uh, in, the, in its tail. This particular tadpole uh, grew into an adult frog. The eye and the spinal cord of this growing frog uh, spontaneously connected and spoke with one another. Um, this explantation or this surgical procedure, not only did it not kill the tadpole, it grew into a healthy frog. This frog was able to use the third eye on its back to, uh, uh, for behavior. So this influences that we can, this, uh, this indicates that we can espalier animals in the same way that we can espalier plants. The fact that this is possible suggests how far can we push this process and what kinds of manipulations might we want to uh, perform. So I'm going to switch now and talk about some very recent work. This is our work on xenobots. So imagine that we wanted to produce a millimeter-sized robot that hopefully you can see in the bottom right. We're not going to create this robot out of metals and ceramics and plastics and electronics. Instead, we would like to grow or build this robot out of 100% genetically unmodified frog cells. I'm going to show you a few videos of this process. There are many more videos available on our Computer Designed Organisms uh, website. The first step in this process, which Doug Blackiston, our microsurgeon at Tufts, performed, is to scrape off several thousand uh, epithelial or skin cells from very early tadpole. If you take these several thousand cells and place them in a small dish, which you can see here, the dish is about two millimeters across. Um, the cells are suspended in uh, room temperature pond water. You'll notice that these dissociated skin cells don't like to be on their own. They will spontaneously cohere or pull together into more or less a sphere of uh, frog cells. This is the raw material that we can then take and influence towards our desired shape or our desired behavior. <laughs> What you're watching now is you're looking through the microscope along with the microsurgeon who is now gonna reach into the dish. And uh, what you're seeing on the right is a micro cauterization tool. This is a very hot wire that can burn away or remove uh, some of the, this tissue and a, a very small uh, pair of pliers on the left-hand side. What you can see is the microsurgeon trying to sculpt from frog cells the desired shape at the bottom right. You're looking now at the ventral surface or the bottom surface of this xenobot being uh, constructed. And you can see the beginnings of these four ventral uh, small legs that the microsurgeon is creating. This was the first experiment that our team of four conducted, which is not strictly resulting in a living robot. This is a living sculpture made out of skin cells, which of course this uh, what you're seeing in this video here actually resulted in the image you see in the bottom right. So this is a living sculpture. How do we take one step further and move to living robots? The way we did this is to uh, go back for a moment and consider constructing robots from two types of skin, uh, two types of frog cells, skin cells which you're gonna see represented in this computer simulation in a moment, represented with these light blue voxels or 3D pixels. We also made av available for the creation process these red voxels, which are frog muscle uh, cells. We would like to create a robot that perhaps does not look like this, but perhaps is able to move along the bottom of the Petri dish. So instead of asking our microsurgeon can he build a sculpture that looks like this? We're gonna change the question and ask, can we build a robot out of frog skin cells and frog muscle cells that moves like this? We're gonna ask for a desired behavior. Turns out that for a human microsurgeon or any biologist, it's extremely difficult to figure out how to combine frog uh, muscle tissue and frog skin tissue to produce a millimeter sized robot that walks along the bottom of a Petri dish. So we took a step back 
And instead of asking a human biologist to design a Xenobot, a Xenobot we asked a supercomputer to do so. This is now, uh, you're looking through the eyes of the supercomputer into a simulated, uh, a simulated Petri dish. What you are watching is the supercomputer testing one possible design. The supercomputer has put together a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these skin cells, the light blue voxels that you see here, and a bunch of the red cells, which you can see are increasing and decreasing in volume. If you take a uh, muscle tissue, either frog or human muscle tissue, and you rearrange it away from the normal shape of muscle tissue, those cells will spontaneously increase and decrease in volume, but they will not synchronize with one another. They will do their own thing and basically move at random. We have asked the supercomputer to design a Xenobot for us that moves along the, the bottom of the Petri dish. And you can see that this particular design that the supercomputer has created does not do a very good job of that. So the computer throws away this design and creates a different random arrangement of skin and muscle tissue. And this second design, as you'll see in a moment, also does not move, uh, does not move very far from the starting position. The supercomputer creates a third random design, a fourth random design, a fifth, the sixth, the tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth random design and performs a trial and error process across this population of random designs. It turns out that some of these random designs happen to move a small distance away from their starting position and the computer keeps those. And as I just mentioned, the computer deletes all these other non-moving random designs. The computer then takes these surviving designs and makes copies of them. And every time it makes a copy of one of these simulated designs, it introduces uh, a random change. It adds or removes a bit of heart, uh, uh, a bit of muscle or skin tissue from somewhere on the body. It then takes these new designs, which are similar to but not identical to the surviving designs, tests how far they move in the simulated Petri dish, and repeats this process. The supercomputer repeats this process for hours or days, or in this case, weeks. What I've just described to you is known as an evolutionary algorithm. So we've already talked about uh, evolution once when we talked about artificial selection. What we have done in this case is to take evolution and put it inside a supercomputer. And we have asked the supercomputer to evolve a Xenobot for us that moves along the bottom of the simulated Petri dish. After a few minutes, uh, sorry, not after a few minutes, after a few weeks, the supercomputer gave us back, gave us back this particular design, which as you can see, it doesn't move that quickly, but it consistently moves from the left side uh, of the simulated dish to the right side of the dish. You'll notice there's mostly skin on the top, mostly uh, heart, uh, muscle tissue on the bottom. What the supercomputer has evolved is a Xenobot that moves non-randomly, consistently moves forward, but it's made up of random components. This is uh, something that's beyond the ability of most human engineers and biologists. If I asked you to make a machine, but I gave you a list of parts and I told you I didn't quite know how all these parts work, some of them are a little bit random, it'd be very difficult for you to put randomly acting parts together to produce a, uh, a robust and consistent machine. Evolution, as always, is an immensely creative force and is able to do so. We then took that evolved design out of the supercomputer. We went back to Doug, our, uh, our microsurgeon, who was able to construct a copy of this evolved design, now using frog skin and frog uh, muscle tissue, and produced the first computer-designed organism, which you see in the bottom. We're looking at the physical Xenobot from the top. We've sped it up about four times, not a very fast moving organism, but this is an organism that has never existed before on Earth. It does something useful for us, which is move along the bottom of the Petri dish, or at least it's doing what we asked it to do. And its provenance, where it came from, is again very different. It is not strictly part of the tree of life. Um, it is clearly a branch uh, off of frogs, but it is in many ways a unique 
participant in life here uh, on Earth. Now that we have this process, we can ask questions like, what can we do with it? Turns out if we take a population of xenobots and put them in a simulated or a physical Petri dish, you'll notice that they can move around. In some cases, they attach to one another. It wasn't immediately obvious to us if this was just a random byproduct of these evolved designs or whether these xenobots are actually intelligent in some way. I'm gonna zoom in on one of these xenobots. You'll notice that this particular xenobot seems uh, interested in this small uh, glass pellet that we put in the dish. You'll notice it kind of circling and pushing this uh, pellet. The probability that it would produce this behavior by chance is close to zero. So there seems to be some inherent intelligence uh, in these xenobots. I realize that I'm uh, out of time, so I'm gonna pause there and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, Professor Bangard. Really, we're actually just using you for your Xenobots. Of course, <laughs> but no. always. Um, um, and definitely we will, I encourage all um, viewers on YouTube to send us some questions through the chat because we will have all our presenters at the end and open up questions, especially for our keynote speaker here. So thank you once again. You're welcome. I will be bringing Professor Anto Marini to the screen. Hey. And <laughs> Okay, so uh, I would start uh, from the end of uh, uh, Professor Bonger's speech that is uh, these uh, new entities uh, produced by artificial selection move uh, in a way that it is not random. So they seem, uh, Professor Bongwell may uh, argue that, uh, they seem to move with a name, they seem to have a name. So the, we cannot say that they, these, uh, these uh, entities uh, have a name or have a will, but nonetheless, they have a telos, they, are, they have a direction, they, they go ahead somewhere, they have a destination. This is a teleology, so teleology is an ancient uh, philosophical issue, um, absolutely connected to hu with human and then with animals, but not so much with plants, with living beings, but of course not with robots. Uh, uh, or artificial machines, but uh, since uh, cybernetics, uh, uh, we can uh, find, uh, as uh, Norbert Wiener said, we can find machines or cyborgs uh, uh, with uh, sensory with a sensory apparatus, uh, or with at least uh, two neurons, uh, uh, the, the simulation of two neurons. So what is that? Do we have the conceptual uh, frame to uh, and this conceptual language to talk about a teleology that is a uh, oriented behavior that doesn't use a humanistic or a rational model of behavior? This has been the case with the first cybernetics. This has been the case with endosymbiosis, endosymbiosis by Lynn Margulis, for instance, in which a key notion is involution. And maybe the Xenobot is an example of that, that is uh, evolution is when organism is uh, uh, transformed by nature or in this case by artifice into an organ in order to make a new organism. Uh, Lynn Margulis uh, talked about the cells, uh, uh, bacteria entering the cell, not being digested by the the cell, instead of being digested and being a pathogenic element in the cell, they start working with the cell, making the cell more complex and making the behavior and the activities more complex and more protective from the environment. So this uh, that can be called the cybernetic teleology uh, introduced by the cybernetics uh, is what Darwinism uh, has never explained, has left out. Uh, natural selection destroys, I'm, I think I'm quoting Lynn Margulis, but it cannot uh, create, it doesn't uh, explain 
explain the creation of new organisms. So what is this force that keeps entities together uh, in a way that they can undergo a process in which their organs can be broken down and remade together in other organisms. This continuous process of destruction and reconstruction uh, must be still uh, reflected upon, not only philosophically, but also scientifically. So this is what, uh, uh, you know, my intervention is actually a long question to uh, Professor Bongert. Uh, so what is this dynamics? Uh, can we uh, scientifically or rationally explain uh, the dynamics uh, that um, uh, holds uh, organisms and entities together? Uh, reaching or trying to reach at every step a homeostatic equilibrium. Uh, why do we have or how can we explain this uh, uh, search for a, a homeostasis, a continuous organ uh, equilibrium? So the, uh, uh, shouldn't we uh, forget about, abandon the mechanistic view of, of uh, the universe uh, without fall into the spiritualist idea that everything has a will, uh, has an intention uh, to be kept together. Uh, can, we, uh, can we talk about and can we think, uh, how can we make uh, thinkable the uh, possibility that uh, uh, machines, uh, cyborgs and now these uh, artificial organisms have, how can we think that, that, that this ability, uh, of their ability to uh, uh, have a direction? Do we have an explanation for that? Uh, yes, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Antomarini, and we look forward to discussing this at the end with all our speakers. I will now be bringing Professor Sogna, Stefan Lawrence Sogna, to the screen. And the floor is yours, Professor. Yeah, many thanks. So, yeah, there's so many, so many questions I already have to charge. This was an uh, absolutely fascinating presentation, keynote presentation, which you gave. Um, but I'll be raising them later on as a consequence of, of what I'm presenting here, as, uh, which is um, uh, more about cyborgs as a twist of the homo faber and the homo ludens. In Greek antiquity, leisure used to be identified with an activity of our immaterial, rational soul which reflects upon the truth as correspondence to the world. The true judgment corresponds to eternal, unchanging ideas or platonic forms. Given such an understanding of the world, there were at least two types of techne. It was possible to identify techne with a playful activity which sensually represents these perfect forms on the one hand. On the other hand, techne stood for the realization process of worldly goals, sort of the functional understanding. In anthropological debates, these two understandings of human nature were referred to as homo ludens and homo faber. Homo ludens identifies human nature with playfulness as a source of cultural creations, whereby playfulness stands for the intrinsically valuable activity of being creative. I play is as playing is meaningful to me, but I don't play for the sake of realizing a practical goal. Homo faber, on the other hand, regards human nature with the activity of technologically altering nature, such that goals can be realized which enable humans to live better lives. Both descriptions of human nature imply an understanding of an element of techne. Homo faber and homo ludens represent a binary distinction between two aspects of techne. One stresses the possibility and relevance of solely intrinsically valuable activities. The other one turns all activities instru into instrumentally relevant ones. However, it's this binary distinction which presupposes an understanding of the world which has become implausible after the evolutionary paradigm shift. Homo faber and homo ludens must get twisted into a cyborg to reinterpret, reinterpret our permanent becoming in a more plausible manner. The cyborg is a steered organism, cybernetic organism, and cybernetic comes from Kubernetes, the steersman of a ship. When we are born, we are unable to use language. Yet then we develop further in cultural surroundings which steer us. Steering processes are upgrading processes. We learn a language, numbers, and different kinds of inferences, and thus we are getting more and more steered. 
This is a process of cyborgization. External forces alter our relationality. We used to identify our capacity for using a language with the divine gift, which enables us to get access to a higher non-material mind. Yet such an interpretation has become implausible. And there's no plausible reason for there to be two categorically distant substances. And being so distinct, these two substances could not interact with each other in the first place. Verbal reflections cannot provide us with eternal insights. Possessing a language is a useful upgrade which enables us to communicate better. The capacity of using a language is an organic alteration which was realized by external forces, in particular by our parents, in combination with an organic arrangement which allows such upgrades. At the same time, being able to use a language is a technology which enables us to communicate with others, which is an extremely useful tool. Getting upgraded by means of acquiring a language alters who we are organically, and at the same time, it enables us to realize useful goals. Technology becomes a part of us and serves as a means at the same time. It has become implausible to claim that either the one or the other analysis of technology must exclusively be the appropriate one. The grammatical structures of our language affirm categorically separate binaries which is a challenge for philosophizing, because just by using language, we are forced to, to introduce these, these categorical binaries. We are limited by the grammar of our language. Thus, philosophy turns into a dialectical activity which permanently introduces further qualifications. Whatever you claim needs to be relativized again. Introducing further qualifications lead to self-contradictions, which again implies the need for additional explanations. Because our grammar is structured dualistically as our, our worldview has been for you know, 2,000 years. As cyborgs, we can not commit ourselves to playful leisure as a solely intrinsically valuable activity, as we are caught in a permanent process of becoming in all respects at all times, and we are permanently threatened by death, but the option of grasping any universally valid judgment has become highly implausible. Playful leisure as a reflection on eternal truths can only be a meaningful activity if we regard the existence of eternal unchanging ideas as plausible. In a world of permanent becoming, this is no longer the case. Does this mean that whatever we do has to be concerned with the realization of means for better lives? Are we the homo faber who is solely concerned with the technologies for realizing goals which make our lives better? Can an intrinsically valuable playfulness no longer be regarded as meaningful activity? A playful, leisurely activity can no longer be concerned with eternal truth. However, a playful, creative engagement with the world is an enormously fulfilling activity. In a world of permanent becoming, it, it's the meaning of the meaning of being playful which has to be reinterpreted. Playfulness does not enable you to gain access to divine insight, but playfulness is a demonstration of your strengths. It reveals to others that you do not have to be concerned with working. Working is an activity which is primarily undertaken for making money. Money itself is a means, which can be exchanged for various goods. You need money to pay for a place to live in, food, drinks, clothes, Work is not an intrinsically meaningful activity. It's an activity which provides you with the means which enable you to pay for other means like bread and water, which you need to survive. Slaves need to work, but aristocrats can dedicate themselves to the reflection on ultimate truths in correspondence with the world Aristotle stressed. In a non-essentialist, in a non-dualistic world, an activity which enables you to cross essences is no longer a plausible activity. Hence, Aristotle's account is no longer plausible. However, we do cherish a certain playfulness in all aspects of our life. We create, we put things together, order, alter, and innovate. Being creative, being spontaneous, following some rules which we have given ourselves is intrinsically enjoyable, as we are not forced by any need or external force to act thus. We do so as thus the immediate expression of our psychophysiological drives can be realized in our most immediate manner. This is incredibly fulfilling. In addition, it demonstrates to others that you are capable of doing so. You are free to follow your psychophysiological demands and you're not constrained by the obligation. This is also a demonstration of your power. Being able to act thus reveals an enormous freedom. 
At the same time, it needs to be stressed that no one is able to solely dedicate him or herself to play. We need to survive, make money, pay for the daily needs every one of us has. In Aristotle's philosophy, there was a binary distinction between leisure and work. Given a non-dualistic ontology of becoming, this is no longer a plausible conceptualization. The cyborg represents a twist of, of the homo ludens and homo faber. Two yarns are woven into a new kind of unity. We play, we act, and we create, but it's no longer plausible that reflecting upon eternal truth is an intrinsically valuable, playful activity. A world of permanent becoming doesn't have to imply that we move away from the concept of the homo ludens to the concept of the homo faber in the same way as a binary ontology consisting of categorically separate substances like the material and the immaterial cannot be overcome by means of materialism. A Affirming a version of materialism means that you're still stuck in a binary frame of mind. The various threats need to get twisted to conceptualize a more plausible anthropology, which means that the cyborg has to, be, has to come about by twisting the concept of homo ludens and, and homo faber. The cyborg represents a properly non-dualistic anthropology of permanent becoming in all aspects of all times. And sort of in the same way as we got upgraded by means of, of language, and then we continue by learning, by learning mathematics, by, by learning how to make proper inferences about historical circumstances. And now it's, it's sort of the current technologies with which we are confronted with um, digital technologies and brain computer interfaces, and the same way as gene technologies, uh, just in the tradition of what we've always been doing as, 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 as human beings. So sort of, we got upgraded in, with language, and now we've got the possibility to continue further with that development. It's nothing new. It's, it's, it's sort of what we've always been doing. And, and the option of now, and this is also already the question sort of I'm, I'm raising also to Josh, um, sort of traditionally, um, many, many of the transhumans thought it's, it's about them um, putting the mind, um, putting the personality on a hard drive or what I regard as more plausible, sort of, you know, like Musk Neuralink establishing the brain computer interfaces. Um, however, there's also the option, it seems to be, of, 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 having, of having a living computer. And, and, and sort of his research seems to provide some, some, some guidelines for this, some possibilities. I'm curious what we would have to say about it. So um, whatever the future of the human development will be, it is important to recognize that we have always been cyborgs. Many thanks for your attention. We thank you, Professor Sogner, for your insightful reflections and these important questions you bring up. And we look forward to speaking about this twist um, at the discussion time we have later. With that, I will be bringing Professor Nefeli Misuraka to the screen. Here we are. And the, oops, perfect. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll try to, uh, talk about humans right now very briefly, much like in uh, a chapter in of the selfish gene by Richard Dawkins, some bats talk about humans. You know, there's this conference of bats trying to figure out what humans are. Um, so uh, it's a conference much like this one, right? So um, I'll start with a, a, a few platitudes, I guess. Um, but uh, hopefully to get to um, a provocative question on, on humanism. And I guess that uh, um, I will be talking about things that are tangent to what Professor Sogner just uh, discussed about uh, reinterpreting playfulness. Um, so, um, well, humans, um, the more uh, our species has um, somehow become more sophisticated, the more it has detached from uh, a serene kind of approach to death. And therefore that kind of, um, uh, as far as we can see, acceptance or um, um, serene approach that animals have to death. And, and this has prompted humans uh, towards a search for universality, um, even um, not just in, in life to reach um, eternity, but a form of universality that is also in thought. Um, in behavior, 
and therefore in ethics. So uh, a way to codify and to distinguish our behavior from the behavior of uh, other animals uh, that die. And so hopefully we, we don't. Uh, so, um, and the more we separated ourselves from, from, other, from the rest of the animals, um, the more it appeared disturbing to humans, to us, uh, that we would behave like any other animal or plant for that matter. Uh, since the history of our existence on earth has been punctuated by a constant distancing from the animal world. And now here I'm using the term punctuated in the sense um, of Stephen Jay Gould's principle of punctuated equilibrium, um, a form of apparent stasis in a system that appears as otherwise um, developing. And it is in fact not surprising that systemic studies um, of evolution appeared relatively late within the sciences. And to this day, the hypotheses in this field vastly outweigh um, the confirmed theories. Uh, so in a sense, the idea of a progression in evolution, uh, one that would lead from simple life forms to the perfect human, is less interesting, right, somehow, to, to humans themselves then the idea of a rupture of a clean break and this is why maybe punctuated equilibrium have or had um, um, a certain importance or a certain echo um, so um, there seems to be no way um, anyway to escape from this superiority complex from this idea that we uh, transformed from animals but we're not so there has been a rupture there. There is a non-communication between humans and, and animals. And it is this very complex, uh, this superiority complex, that now makes us think that we should save the world. Um, not really, I think, deep down for all of the good reasons that are brought forth, but because we can. We should save the world because we can, whereas the world, the animals, plants, nature itself is kind of helpless and um, cannot save itself. Um, so this is a, the presupposition is um, of an idea of nature or the plant of the animal world that tends to preserve itself uh, through some sort of wise concept of self-preservation. Uh, so it's an idea again of a serene nature, of a golden state of nature we'll know about, idealized as much as it is perceived as impossible because we are not natural beings. Uh, humans are above nature. And we, uh, humans, uh, proudly strive, strive to defy the laws of nature. So we admire more those who defy those laws by building airplanes, rockets, than those who theorize, for example, on nature. Um, so the fact that we perceive ourselves as not natural or non-natural is also what makes us more gladly identify with a robot or with artificial intelligence than with an animal. And this is why we feel that AI is or will be our competitor, not any other animal or some other species from um, the animal world. Uh, after, because after all, we are above nature. And this is also why we gladly dismiss theories around surplus killing, uh, which is um, the numerous events in which animals or plants destroy their sources, their habitat, um, thereby also endangering their own survival. Um, there are many examples of foxes that raid chicken coops and kill as many chicken as possible, um, too many for them uh, to consume and therefore uh, endangering their own um, substance forward, okay, destroying all of the animals um, that would later give them food. Or famous examples like the 1976 experiment of the mice and crows, when a number of mice were introduced um, in an environment with crows and crows systematically within seconds just killed all of the mice, uh, which are their food. So there is no apparent reason for this, or at least we can find apparent reason for this. Um, and uh, uh, 
uh, Stephen Jay Gould himself based an important part of his theory um, on the phenomenon of, I would call it the Terminator starfish um, that destroyed the fauna around it so much that it became extinct in certain parts, for example, of the coast uh, on the coast of Maine. Um, so we can observe a behavior that we humanize and we call sadistic, for example, um, in cats or in other felines that um, play with their prey uh, because hunting and, and playing and playfulness is uh, one and the same. So this uh, behavior um, has become more and more uh, disturbing for us, unacceptable for us, even though uh, we not only hunt for pleasure, but we have many um, instances where we actually um, torture animals uh, in order to hunt um, the well-known practices of caging ducks um, far up on poles so that they will call other ducks to be shot, to be shot by, uh, by hunters. So um, hunting is pleasurable, but we also create some sort of playfulness in torturing animals with the aim of hunting as a pleasurable activity. Um, so we do the same as animals do in the surplus killing um, uh, by destroying resources that keep us alive. And yet we keep insisting uh, that we do this because we are not animals, okay? So we are more cruel, we're more something. Um, so we not only think that we can manipulate nature, we want to. We want to do what nature absolutely can't do. And this is to replicate itself or to generate beings without the use of biological materials. I mean, ultimately, that would be uh, the goal. Uh, we want uh, to do this in order for us to become AI. It's, it's kind of a, a secret and very deep and profound uh, wish. Uh, so, and maybe perhaps this is one of the seductive points in the study of the AI because it is the farthest point of na from nature, so for this very reason. And, well, this is it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Misuraka. What's lovely about this event is we have presenters from various fields, which always provides different lenses with which we can discuss these topics. Um, I will be removing you from the screen now. And with that in mind, um, I've entitled my presentation, uh, Never Let Me Go, The Human and the Marginalized Other. And I recently graduated with an English literature degree, and this means that my go-to um, is literature and narratives. The reason is, through narratives, we can live more than one life. We can be transported, transported to different bodies, times, geographic locations, and social realities that we haven't personally lived, but nonetheless strive to understand. So. After we have imaginatively, imaginatively lived people and situations through literature, we might find it harder to see them as alien and far removed. So actually, we can think of narratives and literature in general as a way to help move away from the idea of the anthropocentric human. We can explore possibly what it means to be hybrid or something different and connected to so many other things in our world and even others. Of course, the other side of the coin is that literature also allows us to evaluate the impacts of various behaviors, developments, and our understandings of the world. Um, a wonderful novelist who I always love to reference is Kazuo Ishiguro, um, who won the Nobel Prize. He was a Nobel Prize winner a few years back. And he invites us in his novel, Never Let Me Go, to live the lives of human clones. Now, these clones are created as children, and they grow up within schools, developing relationships with others, acting like normal children, having feelings, um, and at first, not really understanding why they are different. See, their purposes are merely to exist, and then to one day donate their organs to the rest of us natural human beings. And they do so multiple times, um, aiding the organ shortage crisis, which has deprived thousands of patients of a new and better quality of life every single day. And then, of course, these clones um, die at rather young ages. And we follow this narrative through the protagonist named Kathy. 
and she's narrating her life story as a way of making sense of her meaningless life. This sensitive narrative gives a voice to the voiceless, and in a subtle way, it asks us as readers to evaluate what it means to be a human, or rather to be given the same degree of dignity as a human. Her narrative thus becomes a tool both to connect to the audience and also to establish a personal identity. By giving a voice to the clone, Ishiguro is giving creative power and therefore humanity to Kathy. Kathy, the created, instead becomes the creator. Now, if we can translate from fiction to fact, in reality, um, there are numerous characteristics of non-human animals which could well be in the interest and in the human interest when it comes to aging and medical difficulties and advancements we, we do wish to make. Um, a common example being the axolotl genome, which is a particularly remarkable a genome in this respect because the genome of the salamander, salamander is about 10 times larger than that of humans. After losing one part of a body, a perfect replacement with bones, muscles and nerves grows within weeks. Even if the retinal tissue is damaged and the spinal cord is um, severed, they can be restored. So with our advancements with CRISPR and Cas9 technologies and all these developments, it really is in our best interests to learn and maybe mimic um, from the organisms around us. So what does this mean for us? Does it mean that we will most certainly all become hybrid in some way? Well, with this in mind, it is also important to facilitate how we navigate through social impacts and use literature as a mean to inform everyone of the evolutionary um, um, of the of the evolutionary uh, progress. So, um, in the words of Rosie Brydotti, the posthuman um, enables subtler and more complex analyses of powers and discourses when we move forward in the technologically aided future. So, we start by questioning who might we be whose anxiety takes center stage in public um, debates about the convergence of post-humanism and post-anthropocentrism. See, many feel that we will create a world in which we genetically pre-select features based on what we perceive as healthy and advantageous for humans, which can obviously be paternalistic and an aggressive um, approach. But perhaps only by participating in discourses such as these, um, creating an emotion, um, emotive engagement through literary works, as mentioned, one being Ishiguro's, we can proceed maybe with caution, oversight, and transparency, as we also do have a lot to gain with our, at our advancements. It would be naive to assume that Homo sapiens sapiens will still exist in six million years, times, um, six million years time. Species have to constantly adapt um, to a changing environment. Um, either a species evolves or adapts or it dies out. So it's therefore necessary to constantly resort to new technologies to understand how beneficial the connection to the plants and the animals and the organisms that surround us really are. But also never forgetting to proceed with a cautious and sensitive understanding of the changing nature of us and the world around us and the organisms with which we connect. Thank you. And I would like to now also bring um, another student at JCU, Francesca Dalmazzo, um, to the screen. Francesca, I'm adding you to the stream. Yes. Thank you, Gracie. Hello, everyone. And today I will be presenting about Nietzsche, the overhuman and transhumanism. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Okay. Can you see it? Okay, I guess so. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, it is important to um, underline that since there are some important uh, common elements between Nietzsche's philosophy and uh, transhumanism, um, a lot of uh, philosophers uh, uh, wonder whether Nietzsche can be considered uh, uh, an ancestor of the transhumanist uh, movement. Uh, for example, Bostrom claims that there are merely some surface level similarities with the Nietzschean vision. Then, according to Sorgner, there are significant and fundamental similarities between the post-human and the overhuman. And then uh, Moore is uh, strongly convinced that the transhumanist ideas were directly influenced by uh, Nietzsche. In particular, our, I will be focusing on the concept of the self-overcoming, which is directly connected to the uh, overhuman. Before talking specifically uh, about the idea of the overhuman, I would like to point out a uh, um, crucial aspect, um, which is at the core of uh, Nietzsche's philosophy and refers to the dichotomy being versus becoming. 
In fact, uh, while the history of uh, Western culture is a history of uh, being, which is something fixed and uh, limiting, with uh, Nietzsche we enter a culture of uh, becoming and of uh, perpetual change. Uh, it's important to underline that this applies to all aspects of life, including uh, our uh, human nature. Therefore, we can observe this significant shift from a fixed concept of human nature to a non-essentialist concept of permanent self-overcoming. Uh, so what really matters and what we really need to uh, keep in mind is uh, this constant movement and um, perpetual change. So, uh, according to uh, Nietzsche, this uh, strong driving force that he calls uh, will to power brings about the idea of uh, enhancement, uh, a concept that is shared both by Nietzsche and by transhumanists. Uh, on a more specific note, uh, transhumanism is in favor of technologies and other means which could be used for enhancement of human intellectual, physical and emotional uh, capacities. And similarly, uh, Nietzsche sustains the bringing about of the whole human through the process of uh, overcoming. So, in brief, for both, the main goal is to constantly overcome ourselves, to become stronger and stronger, so that the whole human or the post human in transhumanist words can come into existence. Here, I also inserted um, a quotation by Bostrom who, uh, referring to the influence of the Renaissance period on uh, Nietzsche's philosophy, uh, says that transhumanism imports uh, from secular humanism the idea of the fully uh, developed and well-rounded personality. We can't all be Renaissance geniuses, but we can strive to constantly refine ourselves and to broaden our intellectual horizons. And this willingness to uh, broaden our horizons in Nietzsche's words uh, is called uh, um, overcoming. So, um, concerning the figure of this uh, ideal post-human, there are some disagreements about uh, uh, yes, this figure among transhumanists. For example, um, Espandieri argues that a transhuman is a transitional human, someone who by virtue of their technology usage, cultural values and lifestyle constitutes an evolutionary link to the coming era of post-humanity. So if we follow this theory, we understand that while still being human, the transhuman lies at the basis of the development of the posthuman, which would represent an entirely new species. According to uh, Bostrom, then, by a posthuman capacity, um, he means a general central capacity uh, greatly exceeding the maximum attainable by any current human being. So if we follow this theory, uh, we understand that any human can develop into a posthuman by relying on technological means, which may support uh, an overall enhancement in all human aspects, including both emotional and uh, intellectual enhancement. Um, then, um, what about uh, Nietzsche? So, according to Nietzsche, the hover human derives from higher humans who possess by chance a special nature, which allows them to develop specific intellectual capacities and to enhance themselves. As the Sorg our Sogner states, the hover human comes about via an evolutionary step which originates from the group of higher humans. So, regarding the function of the post human, transhumanists are quite vague and not uh, as specific as uh, Nietzsche. In fact, for Nietzsche, the hover human would incarnate the meaning of all human beings and would fully represent both the inversion of values and uh, the constant uh, self-creation. Uh, uh, lastly, concerning the uh, idea of technology, Nietzsche uh, doesn't talk specifically about uh, technological means of advance, because his idea of overcoming is more based uh, on uh, values. However, his uh, attitude is quite similar to that of transhumanists. Uh, for this reason, um, according to uh, some transhumanists, Nietzsche would probably support the use of technology to strive for the overhuman, as long as its abuse doesn't make humans uncreative. Because, uh, as I said before, um, the process of creation of transformation uh, uh, is uh, like at the core of uh, Nietzsche's philosophy. And uh, so, in conclusion, we can say that being uh, um, a very debated issue, Nietzsche's concept of the hover human doesn't correspond to an universal 
uh, concept of the uh, post-human elaborated by all transhumanists. But some transhumanists have specific theories about the um, post-human, which resemble those of uh, Nietzsche's other human. And uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for your wonderful presentation. I would now like to call up all our presenters. I will be adding you to the screen. You can turn your cameras on. There we go. And we will wait for Professor Sorgner too. Once his camera's on, I will be adding him to the screen. And um, this is where we encourage all our viewers on YouTube to start sending through any questions you may have, particular questions to any of our speakers, um, and also to our presenters if you have questions for one another. Let's see, how should we begin this? Professor Misuraka, do we have any questions coming in from our chat? Um, well, not right now, but I guess that um, there were some questions already implicitly or explicitly asked to Pongard. I don't know if he wants to answer them right now while we're waiting for others to come. Well, I don't know if I have any answers, but definitely uh, maybe some starting points for a discussion. Um, but I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, my, my home territory is robotics and computer science, so I am definitely um, a little bit out of my element here, but uh, that's part of the reason why I'm interested in, in discussing. Um, Brunella, you mentioned uh, Telos, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, when we published the Xenobot paper about a year ago, there was a lot of media attention, a lot of responses from the public about, you know, are these Xenobots suffering? What do they want to do? What are you forcing them to do? What is the what is the supercomputer trying to get them to do? There was a lot of interesting use of language about telos and intention, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, I mentioned my, my biology colleague on this work, Michael Levin at Tufts University. So uh, he also collaborates with Daniel De Dennett, a well-known uh, philosopher of mind uh, at, uh, at Tufts, who also weighed in on this discussion and, and brought in his ideas about the intentional stance, that our, our instinct to attribute telos or intention to others and to ourselves and, and whether that is something that is real and reducible and, and amenable to study through empirical research is sort of an interesting idea. So I, I think one connection that I think is interesting is, is there's something about xenobots or, or computer designed organisms or, or agents that exist between the artificial and the natural that seem to, uh, they seem to trigger this, this attribution of intention, this, what we would say anthropomorphization, but we're not dealing with humans here, zoomorphization or this attributation of telos and intention. I thought it was interesting that the xenobots seem to exacerbate that, that, that phenomenon in humans. And I, I don't have much to say about it other than, than it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. No, this is the model, and I, uh, thank you, Josie. This is exactly what I was wondering when I was listening to you. This these xenobots have a behavior that it is not random. So how do they develop this non-randomness, this uh, uh, direction into homeostasis, homeostasis or equilibrium? How do they keep themselves together? Yeah, th that's a the notion like Telos uh, is... Uh, to human, but in, on the other hand, we cannot renounce it. We cannot get rid of it. So maybe the xenobots uh, have a hidden answer, and of course, it's not up to you. Maybe it's not up to the philosophers <laughs> to find an answer. But uh, the answer is there or not? What do you think? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, I think, as you mentioned in in your presentation, oh, these questions may be beyond scientific inquiry. It's hard to know. I think the xenobots just propose ways to think about whether it is within or without the scientific remit. So in, in the case of the xenobots, they are, they are extremely simple. There is no nervous system. There are no neurons, no synapses. There is no digestive system. Uh, there's no vasculature system. There's no immune system. They're about as simple they're about as simple as you can get at the millimeter scale. Obviously, there are viruses and other smaller creatures that are simpler. 
but it is something that humans seem to attribute intention to. And it is clear that whatever these Xenobots are doing, they are not thinking or trying to, they are not intending to maintain homeostasis with the traditional, our, our traditional ways of thinking about thinking, which is a nervous system. Well, they, they do not have any intention, but they do keep it on. They do. Stuff. They absolutely do. And as, as I showed in the very last video, they, they not only hold together, but they exhibit behaviors that look like simple behaviors, sensor motor coordination. They like to stay close to this object and not get too far away. They seem to be sensing and reacting to those objects. They seem that they may be sensing and reacting to other xenobots placed in the dish. But, but how they're doing that uh, remains a mystery. But is it uh, uh, by chance that you use uh, muscle cells? Uh, isn't it in the muscle cells, this uh, natural impulse uh, to move? Uh, so, so the movement uh, absolutely arrives from, arises from the muscle cells, but, move, but reacting to the environment, that's not something that muscle cells traditionally do. That's sense organs and brains and, and other, other systems. There is none of that as far as we know. So you, one, one uh, my graduate student described them as wind up to, uh, toys. They almost seem like a mechanical system where you wind them up and then they do what they want but that they do what they're mechanically destined to do. But the fact that they seem to be reacting to other things in the environment suggests that they are not purely mechanical systems. There is something else at work here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yes, yes, that they don't have a digestive system. Um, why, but you, you refer to them as being alive. And isn't sort of normally being alive is being attributed to entities which can exist by themselves, be self-replicating, have a metabolism. And how far do these uh, these characteristics or some of these being shared? Yeah. So I think, I think that's a great question. The, the xenobots also militate against our conceptions of life. So what, what, is, it, what is the definition of life? Um, we could spend all day, all week discussing such definitions. I, I work in robotics and AI, and most academic meetings degenerate into a discussion of what is intelligence, what is decision. Uh, in biology meetings, sometimes it also degenerates into a discussion of, you know, what, what is life. And I think post-humanism and synthetic biology really presses on those buttons. They challenge us to to reflect on, do we actually know what we mean when we say that is alive and that uh, is not? Because someone like Stephen Hawking in an interview said, sort of the computer virus is already a living entity. However, we wouldn't normally, we don't regard viruses as being alive because they need a host in the same way as the computer virus needs a host. Sure. So it definitely undermines our traditional concept of be what being alive means. Uh, if you were pressed sort of on the issue of, of the being aliveness um, of your creations. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, what, would you, what would you answer? Yeah, I, so I can tell you what I would answer, but whatever I answer, again, it's my personal opinion in the okay. same way that Professor Hawking's statement that viruses, computer viruses are alive are deriving from his definition of what is alive and what isn't. But that is not a, that is not a rigorous way to proceed, right? Um, what, I can, what I can say is that xenobots somehow seem to exist at this this interface in a similar way that viruses do. People argue about whether viruses and computer viruses are alive or not, because most people sense they're on a border somehow. But it's harder for it's hard for many people to articulate beyond that exactly what they mean by that border. And xenobots, based on the public response we've gotten, seems to seems to press on some of these same buttons. Is is it alive or isn't it? What, what I, I, I'll try and answer your question um, by unpacking it and asking, is the xenobot alive at what level of organization? So as I mentioned, the xenobots are made from genetically unmodified frog cells. So if you zoom in and look at a, an individual frog cell in a xenobot, it's indistinguishable from a frog cell in a naturally evolved frog. 
So that cell, if you're willing to attribute life to cells, that's a living, breathing frog cell. You put those together to make a xenobot, or you put them together and make a frog, and now you can ask questions about is the aggregate alive or not. So it also depends on what level of organization you're, you're talking about. Where does it get the energy from? Yep. So um, the cells themselves come with, uh, they, they come with material and ATP. So they're sort of stored up uh, resources that the cells uh, metabolize and use. Um, and it runs out after about a week. So these xenobots do what they do in the, in the dish, like I showed you, for about a week. And then they slowly, uh, they eventually slow down and, and just decompose back into biological material. So the battery gets decharged. The battery runs out. Yeah, exactly. Which then would be an argument against there being aliveness. No, if <laughs> it's just a... <laughs> we run out of energy eventually too. Yeah, sure, sure. We 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 fight entropy for a little bit longer than than the xenobots do, but the grand scheme of things, not that much longer. And, and, and about the question uh, I, I sort of addressed at the very end of my uh, my presentation, because many people, because, I mean, all of this has an impact on, on one of the options of further development of what sort of transhumanists think about mind uploading. In order to realize that we would have to, to place a personality on the computer, we would have to guarantee some life being alive on a silicon basis first. And so far, maybe the, the, the computer virus is the best thing for that process. I've, I've got some reservations. I definitely don't share that it will be possible in 20, 30 years time, but it's an interesting thought at least, which I cannot exclude. But maybe, and, and, and this was sort of the alternative thought, uh, maybe instead of trying to, trying to merge with a computer in this way and, and realizing the upload to, uh, 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 on, on, a, on a hard drive, Maybe it would make more sense to create a, a, a carbonate-based computer in this way. It's a and great isn't that sort of sort of the direction? There seems to be a lot of potential in in, in, in the research you've been presenting and what you've been doing. And what 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 were the people at um, MIT who've who've realized genetically modified um, uh, cells? which managed to react sort of to external sources is, is a living tattoos. So when, when, um, when the sunlight gets more intense, they change the color. And that, that would be, again, an alternative way of maybe realizing this. But yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I think, um, you know, the xenobots are part of this larger landscape of synthetic biology, which is you know, very much aligned to post-humanism and ideas about your body hacking. Um, so you can invert the process. You can ask about making computers or robots out of living tissue. And the xenobots are an example of the, of the latter, right? Rather than simulating a living process inside a traditional computer, the, these examples are inversions of that concept, you know. I have a question. And I hope it's not too abstract or linguistic, which is the same thing, perhaps. Um, but it's about the, the words that we're using, um, specifically robot, right? So Professor Sogner um, mentioned the origin and the play it comes from, and actually the Slavic uh, roots, which is, as I understand, worker or peasant. Uh, so uh, in a way, the idea of creating a slave um, an, an entity that would do things for you without developing any particular individual conscience because that would be would defy the purpose. Um, I'm wondering, should we still use robot or composite words with robot in it now that we are trying actually to do something um, very different, right? We're not trying to take uh, agency away, but actually infuse agency. I, I Yeah, that's a great part. Uh, that's a great point. I. I'm actually in favor of using the word robot for the reason you just said, that it's a it's a ethical reminder to us that this particular technology, we are designing this technology to do something for us. There, when I mentioned evolving these xenobots in a supercomputer, we tell the supercomputer mathematically what the xenobots should do, and the supercomputer then goes looking for xenobots that do exactly that. So 
You could then ask about agency, you know, how much agency do the, Xen do the Xenobots have? It seems that they don't have very much. The supercomputer also doesn't have much agency. We are telling the supercomputer what it should design or, or evolve. And we can then ask, you know, should we be doing this or how should we go about doing this? So I think the, the very word robot is a good reminder that we, we there is much ethical uh, and regulatory work to be done here. The, the xenobots and other examples in synthetic biology demonstrate that it can be done. And as we know from the history of, of technology, it, it will be done somewhere. And it's, it's up to us to think carefully about uh, how we should do so. Is the use of the term robot also a rhetorical help in order to demonstrate, um, oh, it's just a thing, we can, we can do with it. We're not playing God here. We're not doing something forbidden. It's, we don't play around with life. It's, it's a robot is a thing. So yeah. obviously what we're doing here is morally legitimate. We don't have to have any worries about this. And by using just the term robot, that might, might soften certain worries. Uh, perhaps that hasn't been my experience over the last year since the paper has been uh, has been published. Um, people are extremely concerned about you know whether we should be doing this. Um, you know questions about w where the field is going, but then also the the nuts and bolts of the xenobots themselves. So are the xenobots suffering? We we know they don't have nervous systems. Um, so if they are suffering, they're not doing so in the traditional sense. But it's interesting that. We as a society ask those questions when, when we ha when we have industrial farming. There are animals that are great in great numbers that are suffering. Um, it's kind of a, a yeah. It's interesting that dichotomy. So much a lot of attention on the suffering of these small creatures, which have no nervous systems. Mm. And really not, normally, with suffering, sort of you would need. I mean, normally. It, it gets stronger the more complex your your brain is sort of it's usually related to the complexity of a brain you need to have at least some consciousness self-consciousness and obviously a nervous system in order to 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 at least have some kind of suffering as least as far as we know it on the other hand there are more than there are um very few humans uh, on earth um, who also cannot who at least cannot experience directly any 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 sensual pains or when they hold their mm -hmm. fingers in a in a in a in a um on a staff they put it on the staff they don't feel it but it, it clearly does them harm so one could wonder whether they are experiencing any, any pains or maybe just pain might be maybe there are different ways of pain Pain can also be related to, to a conceptual, to an understanding. Um, one could, could one could imagine um, a type of pain was which is related, sort of an, a cognitive pain. There was a work um, being presented by um, by Catherine Hales in her latest book from Critical Posthumanist, and she sort of uh, gave the example of. Um, uh, of the invisible gorilla example, the invisible gorilla, where sort of the, um, the, the the basketball players pass on the ball to the various players, and then you, as the the one who's uh, watching the video, is being asked to is being asked to count how often does the ball gets uh, passed on to the next player, and then you're focused on 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 counting, and uh, afterwards you're being asked, so how often did the ball pass? Uh, did you know realize anything else? And most people didn't realize anything else, but then when you watch it again, there was an invisible, like a gorilla passing through the players, which you didn't see. And she was using that as an example in order to demonstrate that, well, something like cognition can be independent, no, uh, can be independent of consciousness. So it is clearly, um, it is not in our consciousness um, we are not. We were not conscious. We didn't see. We didn't remember the the gorilla. However, um, it was clearly in our cognitive field. So maybe cognition can actually be separated from consciousness, and then maybe cognition by itself ma might be a basis for 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 establishing a, shine, a kind of cognitive pain, like the person who's 
like 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 the humans who cannot sense who cannot feel the pain but they understand that they're in pain when they get hit when they would get hit by a car or when they put their hand on the stuff they cognitively act as if they were in pain so and, and this is i think an example of um, one example which demonstrates that um it's a, it might be important to rethink what being in pain means and yeah, to, but... to think about alternative ways of being in pain also when we talk about fetuses is a fetus in pain without probably being conscious and so that might also apply to to the xenobots well but actually uh, the xenobot uh, of course it doesn't suffer but uh, given that the computer uh, finds a way among the thousands of random experiments and found a way in which the cells uh, are kept together they have already an instinct uh, i don't know if instinct is the word uh, for self-preservation so once that we threaten the self-preservation that might be called suffering but of course suffering in the sense that it is not suffering as humans mean it that is, you know, I go back to Spinoza, that is, every being tries to, to preserve itself. So this is an animal, this is a life, uh, this is maybe rocks, I don't know, any, every system tries to hold on itself. And this is the case of the xenobots, or not? I, again, I think the, the xenobots just help highlight our ignorance about this question. I don't know whether the xenobots have a sense of self-preservation or not. We could approach it from a behaviorist wow. point of view. We could we could bring we could approach them with stimuli that that frogs typically don't like and see whether the xenobots similarly move away from danger. But it, yeah. you know that's about as far as we can go. Maybe it's the next step. Possibly. We have a question that I think uh, is interesting. Um, I don't know who wants to take this on. Trans transhumanism. <laughs> it's a very meta question. It's a difficult question in, in the sense of sort of, well, um, um, I guess even 20 years ago, we wouldn't have imagined how far progressed we already are with, with respect to the mobile phones. Sort of Nokia um, was the leading mobile company in 2007 when Apple developed the iPhone. Nokia would have never thought uh, <laughs> that they would be falling behind, that they you know, hardly exist after, after such a short period of time. Sort of when it comes to the evolution and the direction and what will come afterwards, sort of making the predictions on the future, um, I, I, I think that's, that's uh, on, a proper, on a proper scholarly basis, this cannot, cannot probably be done. I think the best one can do is, is I guess, to say, well, um, it, it seems pretty likely that at least in a couple of, Hundred thousand years. It is unlikely that human Homo sapiens sapiens will still exist. So either we will have died out as a as a consequence of some asteroids or some pandemic crisis, or we will, or we will have evolved further into into another into another type of type of living entity. But what that kind of entity might be. So. Um, but I think it, it does, rep transhumanism as an approach does really represent quite a paradigm shift or in, in general evolutionary thinking does represent quite a paradigm shift with respect to our cultural historical past, which has always had the notion of some, some human nature, some unchanging essence, something which comes from outside, a, a divine spark from higher up, which makes us special. And sort of by introducing that evolutionary way of thinking we, we've understood that everything is, 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 is contingent, that everything is in the process of becoming, that we are actually, we are hybrid cyborgs, not only cyborgs, but also hybrid because we have more non-human cells in our body than actually human cells. And that in the first place raises um, the option of also taking, taking the possibility um, 
of changing who we are into our own hands um, and not not playing God and not being the hubris of, of being of, of taking in God's role but it's basically understanding you know changing who we are has always been what we've been doing and now we've got the possibility to more and more do so and that is I think an extremely exciting time which definitely raises some 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 challenging question in particular when um, and and I guess church you must get confronted with them doing actually this work uh, firsthand um, do you receive threats from some groups, some interest groups? Is is what what is sort of the political situation about about these kinds of works? Uh, yeah, I can I can speak to that a little bit. Um, as as I mentioned, we published this paper a little over a year ago, be, before the pandemic started. Um, so there was a brief period of of a lot of uh, response to this work, and it's still going on to this day. And as you can imagine, the, pub the public response was everything you can possibly uh, imagine. Um, I there was definitely a lot of negative responses to the introduction of this uh, technology. Sh should we be doing this? Are we playing God? There was definitely a lot of questions about that. Questions about, you know, are these, are these machines suffering? But then also, um, this this trepidation or this fear about where this technology is going, as you as you were just mentioning, uh, Stefan, the fact that it's surprising how quickly we're now making progress. My, my feel my feeling was that a lot of the fear um, and anger about this technology was not directed at the technology itself, but this fear about how quickly things uh, are are changing. Have you been? Um, um sort of in contact we talked earlier um just before we officially met uh, about kevin warwick and he mentioned some research to me where he took the um the cells what was it cells of a monkey of a monkey's brain and he placed it in some robotic device it was just the neuro neuronal cells getting connected into into robotic device having some initial stimulus and then um, whenever sort of the robotic car moved to an end it automatically turned to to one side and when it turned to the right side it received a positive stimulus and after an initial period of time what happened was was that basically the neurons continued to grow and and continue to get connected without any external stimulus and they they continue to exist um yeah i think um i i don't know if professor warwick did any of that work himself that might be the case but i, uh, I think steve, he did. steve potter at georgia tech um at least 15 years ago did perform the experiment you described which was to culture and grow uh neurons on electrode arrays that were controlling a robot, right? So, a, an artificial body with a biological brain, um, and that technology has come a long way in the last 15 years. So, I think this this also relates back to Fabrizio's questions here about, you know, is this still is this still transhumanism, or have we gone beyond transhumanism? Is that the the ways in which we can mash up biological and artificial systems? The, the breadth of the different ways we can do that, at least to me, is surprising. That it's not just hacking the human body. That's not the only path towards creating hybrid systems. There are many, many more ways to combine artificial and biological material. And there are lots of interesting scientific and philosophical implications of that, I think. Yes, and perhaps we can just ask ourselves, what's the place? first of all, of suffering and pain in research, um, at least in abstract terms, not to, you know, <laughs> um, scandalize anyone uh, too quickly, but really abstractly thinking, uh, the place of pain and suffering, especially since we are human beings, and, and for the past 3,000 years at least, we have been theorizing about the importance of the experience of pain, of the experience of suffering, how that has a role in knowledge and research, which is what we're talking about here. So um, yes, abstractly speaking, um, 
the xenobots or any other formation may experience suffering. Well, what is this, the place of it really um, within the research? Right. Um, to me, there's, there's two approaches to your question. There's first of all, the, the ethical question of how much pain and suffering should we inflict on animals to reduce suffering in humans? So there's the question of animal welfare in science. That is one set of questions. The other set of questions, which I hope the xenobots can help with, is what you mentioned, which is we, we are woefully ignorant on understanding the suffering in others. I, for example, I cannot tell you whether the xenobots suffer or not. They, they do not have nervous systems, so I can, we, the team can probably tell you they do not suffer in the traditional sense of a higher animal with a nervous system that can that can introspect and observe the suffering of its own body. They don't suffer in that sense, but whether they suffer in some other way, we, we don't know. And so as a scientist, I feel it is a moral obligation for us to ask the question of whether science in general and synthetic biology in particular can help us understand the nature of suffering. What is it? Can we better understand in another animal, another hybrid, can, can we gain a better understanding of whether and how it's suffering? That, that is an important question we should ask. Well, it's a complex question because suffering is exactly the condition from which we want to step out. So it's not that uh, it's only useful. It is useful, as Stefan and Nepali said, you know, we need to, feel the suffering in order to cope with the external environment and make a decision. But of course, if we make xenobots, uh, to, uh, apart from the playfulness and the self-referential self character of science, can be useful. No, and maybe you, uh, of course, you can say more about that, but they can be used for exactly to reduce uh, human suffering or even animal suffering. So, you know, they can be uh, used uh, to reduce the suffering, not uh, necessarily by suffering themselves. <laughs> you know, suffering is a complex notion. We cannot just say suffering is useful, suffering is useful. You know, it's exactly the double face, you know, the double uh, identity of any kind of reaction, emotional reaction. Right. And actually, we have a, a question that is connected to uh, Nefeli and also to Josh, that is. Uh, uh, Nefeli seems to say, yes, it's true that we are anti-anthropocentric in uh, transhumanism, but uh, you seem to have a but, it is, but it is uh, the human responsibility to uh, solve uh, problems with nature, exactly because we have you know, what is called, uh, philosophers call the second nature. It is, it is Josh to give uh, the, the computer the algorithm. So there is still, do you think that these, uh, your view of transhumanism, your view of the humans being above nature is still uh, uh, humanistic or we are still, uh, we have, we are responsible in this uh, uh, unila unila unilateral way toward nature, nature in a way that doesn't imply humanism anymore. What, what does it mean above nature? It's an ambiguous notion. Well, um, the way I, I, I see it is that there is no possible way, really, the way the human being is built to really um, work with nature. Uh, there's a hierarchical presupposition. And even all of the research that we are doing, we can say it's aimed at ultimately benefiting nature, some species, suffering or whatever it is, but the endeavor of um, uh, the humans have been typically one of either altering nature or producing um, thought that is abstract from nature. This is why I was asking the question about research. I mean, wh what are we talking about when we talk about um, suffering? Of course, uh, we inflict suffering in, in many, many ways, right? But the, it is some sort of drive of the human to overcome 
not consider, go above, and, and this, I think Francesca has a lot to say about this, right? The Nietzschean um, concept that comes from um, thousands of years before, because he, he was focusing on uh, a primal and, uh, and Greek ancient thought. I mean, this idea of pain is not really relevant to us, right? Ultimately speaking, it is more important the endeavor of research, of finding things, of solving things. I feel that this superiority complex when it comes to transhumanism, metahumanism, um, it's a number of reasons that we attach to what we normally do, which is develop thought as abstract as possible. And if in the process this causes pain, we've always we, we have also codified and, and reasoned with pain as being necessary and actually uplifting, either in religious sense or in, in purely rational terms. So th this is what I mean by, by saying that even uh, more, um, uh, let's say, uh, evolved concepts. Um, or modern or contemporary, uh, still have this uh, bias, this superiority complex. Not necessarily, I'm not saying this in a necessarily bad way. So you see why I, I was meaning that my intervention to be provocative, right? So the acceptance of pain of others and of ourselves, uh, the um, taking it into consideration because there are other aims which are outside of nature. Nature lives, suffers, and dies, right? But we do all of these things to develop something that goes beyond, besides hmm? good and evil. So, yeah, maybe Francesca has more to say. Yeah, maybe Francesca can elaborate on that. Yes, that's basically, yes, Nietzsche's main like idea about this aspect of uh, like going beyond because in his opinion nothing is stable so we are constantly evolving and changing and so yes that's no there's no limit to human evolution and that's also what transhumanists actually argue for so yeah but well, we may have uh, two different points that is uh, uh, the human, according to Nefeli, still has a fundamental role. We cannot just uh, go beyond the human if the, only the human can be responsible for the for going beyond itself. Kind of paradox. Uh, but uh, Chrissy, uh, Chrissy's presentation dealt with identity. Given that uh, the human identity is. Uh, uh, dynamic, is fluid, uh, is not fixed, uh, doesn't have any essence, uh, is a, don't we fall into a contradiction? That is, uh, either the human uh, fixes for itself uh, an essential identity or not. <laughs> what would uh, Bonga say or Chrissy say about that? That is, uh, when uh, Josh works, uh, the, the, do you feel that you master everything that you do or somehow you get a feedback from the Xenobot, from computers in a constant systemic relationship that changes or modifies your identity as a human? Or so maybe Josh and Chrissy can elaborate. I'll, I'll start and then Chrissy chime in as, as you like. I think, um, yeah, I was very impressed, uh, Francesca, by your presentation, this, this concept of the, begun, be, the becoming rather than the being. I think within science, within biology, within robotics, which I can talk about, there is, there is the legacy of Western thought and this platonic ideal that there is the human, the robot, the adult frog, that there is this static form and I think this is one of the reasons why it's taken so long until someone discovered the xenobots. The fact that you can influence the becoming of the frog into something else. That that alone is, is it's interesting that it took us this long to get to this point. The technology to do this has been around for quite a while. There's something about, at least in, in the West, in the in Western science, this concept of a static you know, unfixing, uh, unfixed form. 
And I think a lot of this most recent work in synthetic biology is saying if you view the frog or the human or any living organism as something that is constantly changing, constantly becoming, and that process is occurring at all or orders of size scale. So the cells themselves are changing, the organs are changing, the, the individual is changing, the ecology uh, of, the, of the organisms, human society is changing. Once you start to think about change rather than static forms, at least in science, that opens up new questions. Can I deflect this dynamic process in a different direction? Not even towards a different static form, which is what we did in the xenobots, but I think you know, as you start to look beyond that, it's and transhumanism and everything else, it's it's a deflection of an ongoing process. It is, in my personal opinion, it is a continuous process. If you were asking about as the scientist itself or himself in my case, then same thing. It's a continuous, it's a continuous process. But that's also your identity as a scientist receive a deflection. Uh, that's that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. Going back to Chris's idea of identity, uh, yeah. I don't have a good answer to that. Something I, I would need to think about. Great, it's a great question. It's a great I question. Chris, maybe. Go back to your my particular interest when uh, looking at identity, uh, particularly within fiction, but also fictional representations of different um, realities, perhaps, um, is that it's constantly uh, like the term permanently becoming. Um, it's constantly an intersubjective change. Um, in psychology, with a psychodynamic lens, if we think of just the psychologist or the psychotherapist sitting with the patient, it's never a one-way. Um, one-way relationship. It's uh, not unidirectional, but it's always an intersubjective um, exchange. So I guess I look at that lens with which how we interact with our environments, with other organisms, um, also within ourselves. And um, the face we put on within a particular environment is constantly changing and adapting what we evaluate to be the best type of face or best type of persona to put on within. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I have a particular problem with using this human essence or we have this fixed uh, nature. I do believe in this idea of permanent becoming and um, intersubjective exchange, exchanges with our environments. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. And coming back to the uh, question of suffering, and and because that directly relates also the idea of identity. Um, sort of, there's quite some discussion among physicians whether fetuses are suffering. Uh, normally, we would say in order to suffer, you would have to be at least have some consciousness. Can you suffer without being conscious of the suffering? And consciousness is normally identified with something like wakefulness. You know, you are being awa you're awake. You've got your eyes open. You've, this is sort of the sense of being awake, which humans normally only acquire after they've been born. And, and so there's a widely shared tendency to at least say, well, consciousness is something only comes about after having been born. And so, you know, suffering could also only be identified with after having been born. Others, on the other hand, stress, well, if you sort of see uh, one, once, um, you undergo a medical procedure, um, it, and, 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 and uh, there's a, a pregnant woman, um, and the fetus reacts as if it was in pain. Sort of the reaction shows a, a type of pain behavior, and that even though without without probably making or meaningfully being able to conceptualize. A, a type of consciousness in the fetus, but the behavior alone might be sufficient for 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 claiming that that the entity that the fetus is in pain, and so that raises again, which uh, would raise the question for the xenobots in the sense is is there some kind of behavior in the xenobots who which demonst which could demonstrate a type of which we would interpret a way of being in pain as one as the first question and 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 then secondly maybe the issue of 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 pain is not even 
such an important one. I think it's an important one. But sort of so, some, when, when you're being confronted with the question of, well, if pain is a tricky issue, um, and I know that there is research that people have removed um, sort of the, the, the pr brain from mice. Um, the, uh, um, genetically engineer um, mice such that they have no brains, hardly any brain. And uh, only a complex brain would be needed in order to, a more complex brain would be needed in order to experience suffering. If that works on mice, we could, in principle, also do it on pigs. And pigs are very social animals. They are held in factory farms, uh, slaughtered. We eat them, and, and, and they suffer enormously in these circumstances. So if pain is really the tricky issue, wouldn't it be better than to create pigs without brains? Because then, the pos if, if, if sort of the brain is a necessary function for being in pain, then, then at least the pigs wouldn't suffer. And would that make it morally appropriate to hold pigs without brains in factory farms? And this was sort of my further five cents on the issue of suffering. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I guess, so again, speaking, speaking as a scientist, you know, there, it seems to me there is another issue we haven't mentioned yet lurking under this discussion, which is dichotomous thinking. So you, I'm going to put you on the spot, Stefan. You claimed that infants are awake after birth and they're asleep before, right? It, and of course, birth is a pretty discreet event but most biological processes are, con are continuous, right? So again, back to this idea of becoming. So if we wanna make claims that this organism is conscious and suffering or is asleep and not suffering, or this organism at a certain point in time, before birth, after birth, is or isn't, is that even the right stance to take? Is it, is it appropriate from a scientific standpoint to claim a given natural phenomenon is either on or off. My experience, again, I'm not a biologist, but working with biologists, most work in biology points to the fact that these are all continuous processes. If we reject dichotomous thinking and approach pain and suffering as a continuous quantity, as a scientist, we're still left with the question of what are we measuring? If now we're talking about organisms that suffer more or less, what metric are we are we using and that to me that my comment about being ignorant about suffering is that's the problem you can't you can't place a probe into the brain of an animal and say that's the pain circuit that's where the pain is you can't point at pain it is it is a subjective it is something that is subjective that has qualia at least so far scientists have failed to be able to identify and point at at pain. We can point at neural correlates of pain. There are certain brain activity states that seem to be associated with people when they report being in pain. There are behavioral correlates of pain. I take my hand off the hot stove, but those are correlates of pain, not pain itself. So th this is again part of the, from a scientific point of view, why it's hard why I think we should study xenobots and, and approach life and, and try and reduce our ignorance about what pain and suffering actually is. I, I agree with your comment. It is a continuous process. And probably we only introduce sort of the notions of like wakefulness after birth for, for moral reasons in order to have, and maybe legal reasons in order to have some more rigid laws concerning from when something becomes problematic and less problematic. Um, the, the question is, um, if we don't, if we have this non-essentialist account, if we move away from that fixed nature's idea, um, then as a consequence, wouldn't we also have to assume that that what used to be regarded as inaccessible, namely the consciousness, namely something the mind uh, because it's immaterial, because it's out there, because it's not something we can study empirically. But if this is, becomes part of the world of becoming, wouldn't it then have to be possible also to investigate the intensity of pain in an empirical, in a scientific manner? And the question is, how could that be done? And, and, and that would, 
you know, this wouldn't that have to be a sort of couldn't that be a decisive step then also for evaluating which moral status, how much respect we should attribute to the entities, depending on the intensity of pain they can experience, which again, we can measure by means of scientific experiences. If we could get to the point you just described, Stefan, then fantastic. But my, my feeling is we're a long way from there. And so as a scientist, we have to ask, can we help you roll back our ignorance, and if so, how? How do we go about doing so? The, the, the emerging tools, we have new, new systems we can look at, like, like the Xenobot, that we can ask these kinds of questions and study them in new ways. We have a, a broader palette of systems to look at to try and understand you know, what is the nature of suffering. And, and, and being somewhat uh, skeptical as a scientist, the answer might be science cannot contribute to this answer. We cannot give a, a, a useful definition of what pain is. We can, only, we can only understand the correlates of pain. Things that seem to be in pain act in this way. That may be as far as we ever get from a scientific point of view. It's hard to say. And I think that the, the question here seems to kind of give us an avenue, right? Adam is asking a very interesting question about the telos, which I guess calls Brunella into... Well, uh, what uh, Adam's question makes me think is uh, the first cybernetic machines uh, by Norbert Wiener, Ashby, the homeostat, uh, all of them were uh, made in order to find out whether uh, the equivalent or the simulation of a biological brain could be reconstructed like an inverted engineering. Uh, so I, I think there is an underlying telos, but only on condition that we forget about the spiritual value of having a telos and we forget about the mechanical not having any uh, strategy to persevere in their being. So it's a, even a water drop as a telos uh, in terms of surface tension that uh, makes its uh, identity you know, temporarily such. So I, I'm sure that this telos should be further inquired. And I'm sure that the Xenobots might be a great occasion for that. And maybe Josh has a different answer or a different elaboration. I, I think that the, the teleology uh, is the next uh, question for uh, robotics and uh, AI, AGI. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, again, I don't have an answer on on whether biological systems have telos or not. But as a roboticist, we can ask: Is that something that we could emplace into our machines, or if we step back and let uh, our computers design our machines for us, do we end up with machines that have telos? If we ask the supercomputer to design us a xenobot. Does it always give us back a xenobot that, that homeostats? Is that something that tends to always arise in, uh, in intelligently acting agents? I think that's, that's an interesting thing. You mentioned Ashby and, and Norbert Wiener and the other early uh, cyberneticians. For them, homeostasis was an end in itself. We should, we should create things that homeostat because that is somehow useful for other useful function. I would, I would argue, I think it's a good candidate for telos, but I, I think there is an upstream candidate for telos, which is resisting entropy. So why would, why would an organism homeostat? One good reason why it might want to try and maintain an internal temperature and an internal amount of metabolism is to resist entropy, right? Resist falling apart, as you mentioned. Yeah, self-preservation. There's no way that we can uh, avoid this uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If 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 we assume <coughs> early on, um, if we assume that something like investigating suffering is something which is entirely outside of the capacities of of empirical as invest scientific investigation, doesn't that presume 
or at least support the traditional humanistic dualistic substance ontology so here we've got a realm which is empirical inaccessible by the senses by the empirical investigations so it, so there are two separate realms and that's why i think if we take seriously the notion of of of, of a you know this is not inaccessible this is then that in principle it would have to be possible to investigate suffering by means of empirical but maybe not by the empirical means we have so far but in principle it would have to be possible exactly so this doesn't mean we won't someday figure out how to scientifically investigate suffering but at the moment it seems we are not able to make much much progress Well, suffering is differential. It's not that we can give a number to suffering. It's always a differential, uh, more or less suffering. So it's a different logic. It cannot be uh, trapped into a binary logic. Rather, I do not suffer, I suffer. Our body suffer, but we have strategies not to feel the suffering, the pain of the organs. I don't know. So all of this uh, implies a... A, a way a different way to calculate the suffering what makes me suffer doesn't make another one suffer it depends on so many conditions a, a resisting entropy is a way to avoid suffering but how can we measure the quantity of resistance to entropy it's a continuous process what is in a continuous process uh, is not measurable at least you know logically we, we can't uh, imagine that maybe it's not even useful <laughs> why do you think we should measure the the amount of suffering Stefan? Why, why, why should um why, why should we take an entity morally into consideration if it cannot suffer <laughs> so if an entity can we we don't worry about creating a sculpture out of marble because marble cannot suffer. That's why it matters how in intensely an, an entity can suffer or not. And um, so far, there seems to be a hierarchy of suffering depending on, on which capacities the various, various living entities have. And there's a question then again, can, whether it's possible in principle, whether a, a silicon-based entity um, can also have that capacity of suffering, what, what it could be dependent on. Is it just the capacity which carbonate-based entities can have? Or, um, or, or, or is that in principle possible that maybe, and as I tried to hint at earlier, maybe if, if it's actually the case that there is a type of cognitive suffering, then it might be possible for, uh, for a silicon-based entity also to, to being able to be capable of suffering. Um, for example, if, if we can dis disentangle cognition from consciousness, if if we can have um, uh, we um, with if we can cognitize, if we can have cognition without being being conscious of something, um, um, and it is clear that like um, an embodied robot has got cognition, sort of a, a, a robot with sensors can have cognition, cognition, cognitive, cogni cognitive access to the world around. So furthermore, it might be imaginable, for example, um, there are different types of pain. There is a type of pain which is, um, there's a different type of pain if you cut yourself with a paper or if you, if you get humiliated by someone. If, if, if someone humiliates someone else, then the person humiliated does not necessarily feel a bodily pain or does not feel at least the same kind of intensity of pain which the person feels if, if, if he or she cut him, him, him or herself. Um, but, but it would rather be sort of a cognitive realization process. The other person doesn't value me. The other person doesn't cherish me in the way I ought to be cherished, doesn't, doesn't estimate me sufficiently. That is sort of a cognitive process. Whether it has a bodily type of pain or not is not necessary, at least. So. If we have the cognitive process and we've got an embodied AI, which has got sort of access to the world, a sufficiently developed cognitive um, embodied AI, 
then the um, um, then the sufficiently developed embodied AI could have access to the world in the sense like Google Maps telling you how to get fastest from A to B. You ask Google Maps how to get fastest from A to B, but in the end you don't listen. Then the sufficiently developed Google AI might feel humiliated, and um, that might count count as a cognitive pain. And if that counts, and if we can find a way of of, of measuring the cognitive pain of that of that suffering Google Maps algorithm, then we would have to take it in, into consideration as as a, or we would have to attribute a moral status to it and maybe regard it as a type of subject. And that's why it's important to measure the being able or that this is why it would be important to measure or to attribute some kind of quantity to the intensity of pain experience. Yes, but uh, there's an answer concerning animalists, uh, the animalists. Uh, that is, when the pain uh, you give an animal is necessary, that is inevitable, uh, this is the answer. You know, that there is no living entity that doesn't, answer, that doesn't suffer. Uh, living means to destroy other living beings. Uh, I'm quoting from Lynn Margulis. Uh, we eat a salad, we cause some suffering. We eat a tomato, the tomato is destroyed. Uh, so all of this, either it is necessary or not. If I'm justified, uh, why do I do that? Because I want to live, because of self-preservation, because I risk entropy. So the others do the same, the tomatoes do the same, but there's this constant differential and tension that Rather than being measured, I think it should be justified. But why do you think a tomato can uh, uh, can can suffer? It doesn't have a nervous system or a brain, so that it really not the tomato, but the seeds of the tomato. Uh, no, by destroying it, I prevent the tomato plant to reproduce itself. There's some destruction anyway. It's not the tomato is suffering. The, uh, the 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 piece of salad is because the, the roots seem to be. This will be discussed, I think, in the fall. <laughs> anyway, the roots seem to be corresponding to uh, some kind of nervous system. Plants that plants suffer is under inquiry, scientific inquiry now. So uh, uh, it's not that if the plants suffer or not, this will depend my eating them. I will keep eating them because I need to survive. So I, again, suffering is not a matter of measuring, but it's a matter of justification of it. If the Xenobots one day, someday, uh, were discovered to have suffering, but they uh, solve health problems for human beings, what would you do? Uh, we would use them. Uh, sorry for the Xenobots, but they are too useful to avoid the, their suffering. If, if, if suffering was a continuity, as, as George has earlier remarked, then exactly. we would, then exactly. it would, exactly. then it would make even make sense to make possibly attribute a type of suffering to the, uh, not only the Cenobites, but also the tomatoes. Yes, I think so. The tomato didn't want to end up in my, into my mouth. <laughs> In fact, it had a, a, you know, a membrane to keep it together, not to be pierced by my teeth. <laughs> so this is a, a kind of suffering. Uh, and going back to Adam Berg's uh, question, this is the telos that is a mechanical, computational, biological, uh, cyborg, you know, xenobos, the post-cyborg. Uh, it's, in it's inevitable or even useful, as you said before, you know, uh, we, it, it's a, a need to survival, to feel the suffering. Yes, ah, we have yes. Adam is introducing the very um, experts in pain, <laughs> interpersonal pain, which is the Wittgenstein's family. Let's introduce this family together with the Axleys, okay? <laughs> very problematic families. Can I answer Adam? Yes. Uh, yes, Wittgenstein actually said 
there is no pain without the expression of pain. This goes back to uh, Stefan, that is, what if uh, there is no effect of pain? Pain is an effect. It cannot be uh, detected as a cause. So if uh, I don't have any expression of pain, do I suffer? He can start provocatively said, no, I don't suffer because I don't have any expression of pain, of suffering. Uh, intersubjectively means that when I utter a, a cry of suffering, I cry to someone else. Uh, uh, so again, uh, a pain is not uh, an object, cannot be an object. Uh, it depends on so many factors. Uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, condi conditioned, it is absolutely contingent to necessities. Yes, but maybe his determination came from his personal experience. I mean, his brother Paul exercising at the piano, next room. Uh, Sorry, room next... Uh, uh, so. Yeah, Paul, yeah, his brother, and his brother used to say that he could feel his brother's anger seeping through the door and he couldn't play the piano because he felt that pain and resentment. So, uh -huh. Maybe Ludwig thought that you know you're not expressing that, but you're not saying it, so you're not suffering. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I think this idea of the relationship between suffering and intersubjectivity is is interesting again from a scientific point of view, um, because at the moment the you know the xenobots are made from frog cells, but it, it may become possible at some point in the future to construct biobots from human cells. If we ever get to that point, now you can ask. Again, you were um, you were mentioning about subject and object. If I if I am a human and I'm looking at this thing that's made from human cells, is it self? Is it other? If it's made from Stefan's cells, is it different? What if it's made from my cells? Is it different? Now I might think differently about the suffering of this of this other. You know, if it's frog cells and then there's no nervous system, okay, maybe I'm comfortable with it. It's a tomato, it's a frog, it's somehow it's distant from me. But I think synthetic biology and, and what I find interesting about post-humanism is it says that gap, whatever, whatever distance you're resting on to make your moral determination, that gap is narrowing. You may feel comfortable at the moment saying that everything on this side suffers and we should care about it and everything on the outside the fence is other and we shouldn't care but that fence is being you know it is being dismantled extremely quickly in science so yeah i i think like adam's saying there at least scientifically we can't we can't think about suffering apart from intersubjectivity because that the the distance between subject and object is decreasing mm -hmm. What is the problem, practical problem, of uh, um, using human cells for this purpose? And would it be easier, better? Would it be problematic for you if one used um, 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 totipotent stem cells? Yeah. Uh, so again, I'm not a biologist, so I can't speak beyond my expertise. My understanding is there's no theoretical obstruction to realizing biobots out of human cells. It, there, nothing in science says it's impossible. So it's at the moment, it's a question of, of when. Um, and then there is the moral question about assuming that we could construct robots from human tissues. Would we be okay with that? Would we as scientists be okay with that? Would we as a society be okay with that? And then you mentioned stem cells. So which which type of tissues do we feel comfortable using and which ones do we do we not? Why is it still a practical problem, or what's the practical issue with it? I'm just curious. So cells from different species behave very differently. Um, the reason my Tufts colleagues started with frogs um, is because, as I as I mentioned in my talk, they carried out this study in 2013 showing that you could um, ectopically implant tissue somewhere else on the body. You could put it. You could put a, an eye in the tail, and it would not. <laughs> back to suffering, it wouldn't harm the frog as far as we could tell. It grew into a perfectly healthy frog and made use of that material. So there's something about frog tissue that is very permissive. It allows rearrangements and that's what led to the xenobots. 
uh, other other species tissues are more or less permissive, or we don't we don't know how permissive those tissues are yet. Well, the question of intersubjectivity comes up again in our comments. Is, it that, is there another question? Well, it, it doesn't seem to be a question per se, but it seems to reinforce the need for, you know. And this question that is on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. So, so Adam, I think it is a good question. I, I, I have many colleagues who do feel that 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 pain and and self awareness might be something that can be dissociated from intersubjectivity. Science may get to the point where it can point at something and say that is pain and suffering or self consciousness. I, I am not one of those scientists, but it, your point is a good one. There there is disagreement among the scientific community. Whether they make it explicit or not, there's disagreement about whether you can separate suffering from intersubjectivity. Maybe we have one more question to you, Josh, uh, but maybe then we can all sort of go through uh, one after the other, sort of wrapping up, giving our uh, impression, thoughts, reflections, what are the thoughts um, which have most inspired you, which have most fascinated you, um, and sort of in the order of appearance. And the, the, the question I just um, um, uh, w just wish to raise still is, is, is there any behavior in the Xenobot so far, which, which we, which you would interpret as sort of being in pain? My answer, again, this is my personal opinion. Is I, I haven't seen nothing in the videos in the dish that looks like that looks like actively moving away from a stimulus. There's moving towards. So I have shown you that there are xenobots that behave as if they're interested in small glass beads placed in their environment. But it seems a, a far stretch from there to claim they're interested in or they're afraid of or they are currently suffering from. Um, so I, my answer would be at the moment, I, it does not seem as if they are suffering. And maybe, um, yeah, you wish to start directly with sort of giving a feedback, reflections, um, thoughts which you think ought to be addressed uh, primarily, um, some of the ideas which came up, which you thought which were pas particularly fascinating. Um, and yeah, maybe. We'll yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much. This has been fascinating, and I've I've definitely learned a lot. I think um, what I've learned, or at least what's been reinforced for me, is that um, is that the humanities and philosophy has much to offer, the direction in which the these sciences and this engineering goes. And I'd particularly call out um, the discussion about uh, becoming an identity, uh, becoming and identity. I think these are extremely important concepts that I would encourage you to try and communicate to the scientific community. As I mentioned, I think for many in the scientific community, there is a blind spot for this sort of platonic thinking that there are fixed, unchanging uh, forms, and we can fix them, improve them, magnify them, accelerate them is that there is much that we could all gain by, by viewing living systems as things that are continuously changing. Um, you know, there is maybe no such thing as a fixed identity. And, it, and I think, I know I've tried to benefit from thinking in that way and it's led me to, to new kinds of research questions and hopefully uh, meaningful ways of making progress. So thanks very much for, for your thoughts on that. I'd really appreciate that. Appreciated that that part of the discussion and all the other topics we've discussed. Can I? Perhaps we'll go in order. We'll move on to Professor Antmarini. You will close your mouth. Yes, I also learned a lot from it. Of course, uh, uh, in terms of addressing science, it doesn't happen every day. You know, it's very difficult to find. Uh, this um, interdisciplinary confrontation, which is, uh, gives a philosophy a concrete uh, uh, reference uh, and uh, 
modifies its language because philosophers may tend to uh, be attached to a language of tradition, of the philosophical uh, traditions. Instead, uh, uh, gives philosophy a, a, a projections into the future, which is exactly what transhumanism can be. So uh, this uh, uh, connection between philosophy and science, uh, I think, is more and more increasingly relevant. So thank you so much for every, for all of you, from for, to Josh especially. Thank you. And then we move on to Professor Sulka. Yeah. Sort of. This uh, the, the, the dialogue between the disciplines is enormously important. Sort of um, now we we widely recognize um, in the humanities. Sort of we've developed digital humanities. We suddenly need to have an awareness of what is going on in the natural sciences. So 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 more and more pe natural people from the natural sciences engineering get employed also in the humanities. Um, and and it's I think it's extremely important for. Um, scholars in the humanities to recognize the developments and not just to not merely to do some historical research but at least um also to being open and being confronted with the latest developments because they usually challenge your most firmly grounded beliefs which are also still very strong within the humanities um, but at the same time i also need to stress that one mustn't underestimate the capacities which humanities scholars um, have to contribute and sort of to, to waken and their capacity to waken scientists from their platonic slumbers. Sort of this underlying platonic thinking, thinking in traditional unchanging essences, this is the nature of the frog, um, is, is also still widely shared among many natural scientists and whenever I, I give I give presentation as an ethicist um, um, to engineers and to to uh, physicians uh, uh, people in the, from the natural scientists uh, sciences I'm, I'm actually um, quite surprised sometimes shocked of what a what a very how strong the type of essentialism is within within these fields too and um, so this is a way of also by means of cultural reflection it also happens to open up and, and take a more contingent stand towards their own prejudices there are different ways lines of reasoning which need to be taken into consideration firstly and secondly in particular when it comes to to sort of ethical concern ethical reflections um, there is a very uh, nuanced and, and and complexly developed way of thinking about ethical challenges and, uh, and and this is, is something which needs to be taken into consideration when when it comes to making research and deciding what kind of research is morally appropriate and, and problematic in the field of natural sciences. So here, an ethicist, but also other people from the humanities, uh, um, can provide some extremely important insights for the natural sciences. So we can, even though it can be problematic sometimes, just to finding a common language ground. Uh, I think one one can benefit enormously from the engagement, which doesn't mean that a humanities scholar should become a scientist or vice versa, but but some kind of consideration from the others uh, reflection is is enormously beneficial for for a way of actually confronting the central challenges we are all con we're all dealing with, and this is something um, basically when in particular for those who who work on the challenges which occur right now we all have the same kind of challenges and 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 in order to find an appropriate way of dealing with it we need to bring together the various fields of expertise and 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 this is basically the goal of post-human studies and what we're trying to to do here. and so i'm, I'm very thankful and uh, to all of you to having contributed to this and Maybe you want to add something? Move on to uh, Professor. Yeah. Yes, well, um, this was very interesting. Of course, I'm one of those who are kind of outside a specific field of research, and I hope I could have contributed a point of view that is kind of removed. But as you said, you know, it, it's really instrumental and can be important in 
in taking these things into consideration in a more of a holistic way. And I guess just to piggyback off what everyone else is saying, I mean, we should just remember and take into account the importance of the humanities and of narratives, um, these imaginative worlds created that allow us to take a step back um, explore the potential of these wonderful technologies we have, explore our changing identities and environments, our permanent becoming and continuous interactions with environments. And at the same time, narratives could provide a lens with which we can just also critically evaluate the social and the ethical implications Applications um, that one day soon will develop with our advancements. Yeah. Francesca? Yes, so first of all, thanks so much for this uh, inspiring event. I was like, particularly fascinated by how my reflection on the concept of becoming could be connected to much of what we talked about. And also thanks, Josh, for showing us your wonderful presentation, which has been so stimulating. And uh, yes, everything we discussed about was uh, super motivating. So thank you all again. So this is where we say thank you to everyone, especially thank you to Josh for coming and joining our event. Um, the pleasure. second part. So have a wonderful person. evening, everyone. Thank you, and Robert. your creature, Josh. <laughs> We'll invite you again in two years. Let's see what the Xenobots can do in two years. It's a date. It's a date. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.